Donna Pennington again with part four of this series on knowledge integration across disciplines. To summarize the last three videos, I spent some time talking about background on interdisciplinary collaboration and some of the research that's been done on interdisciplinary teams and teamwork. I talked about interdisciplinary research teams being distributed cognitive systems with emergent properties and that the things that you're really after in knowledge integration, things like integrated conceptualizations and share vision are things that emerge from your interactions. They're not something that you can specify right from the very beginning. The second video talked about vocabulary, multi, inter, and transdisciplinary. I uh, helped you understand a little bit about convergent research. We also talked about vocabulary coming out of the social sciences on boundaries and boundary objects, boundary negotiating objects. Then the third video, we looked at mental models and model-based reasoning and how that interacts with boundary negotiating objects. Your mental model is an internal under simplification of reality and with model-based reasoning, it's really mental model reasoning with the use of external representations of those internal mental models. Given everything that we've talked about already, we'll talk about strategies for integrating knowledge based on what we've learned in the research that we've been doing. And I'll talk just very briefly about the test, testing we've been doing on those strategies. Oftentimes we get into these teams thinking that, you know, there's a looming solicitation and the first discussion is what, can, what research can we do together? But our research has shown that it's really worthwhile to spend some time up front just trying to learn each other's perspectives before you start trying to figure out how to put them together in a, in a meaningful way. So you've seen this slide a couple of times, actually. This is my conceptualization of teams as socio-environmental systems. The team is a group of humans that are interacting within a given environment at different scales. There are two things that we think are really important about this. One is that you have a process and that your process is well-defined and it, it's not ad hoc. It's something that is based on theory. And then the um, other thing that I pointed out was the importance of these boundary negotiating objects in making this work. So we're going to look at the boundary negotiating objects first. So here's how we think this works. We have two people in this illustration, but it could be any number of people, and they're from different disciplines. And they have their own starting mental models of whatever the problem is that's bringing you together. At time zero, person one, puts forth a boundary negotiating object, some kind of diagram, some sort of visualization. It could be any number of things. Maybe it's a chart. Maybe he just goes to the whiteboard and starts sketching things. And so that's his conceptualization of the problem. And he puts it out there for others to uh, reflect on. And so they, other people are looking at what he put forth. So that information is immediately absorbed by your, your brain as long as you spend some time reflecting on it. And it immediately starts transforming your mental model to adjust and accommodate that other perspective, the elements of that other perspective that you didn't already have in your mental model. So T1, you have your, now you've changed your mental model in some way, person two has. Person two says, well, I don't quite get, agree with what you put out as a boundary negotiating object, but here's how I think my mental model could tie with yours and they put out a second boundary negotiating object. And the same thing happens. Person one reflects on that and starts transforming their own mental models and puts out another boundary negotiating object. So we're pretty good. Our brains are pretty good at, at transforming information and evolving new mental models. We've been doing it our entire life, but first we have to grasp that information and reflect on it in order to generate those new conceptualizations in our, in our heads. This could go on for any number of iterations. I've seen it happen this way that, you know, you spend an hour just iterating over different versions of the same boundary negotiating object. And pretty soon, everybody sort of sits back and says, yeah, that's it, that's it. That captures my mental model and it captures what I hear everybody else saying. And so that's your shared problem model. It ends up being your shared vision. It's the thing that helps you figure out now what research you can do together. 
And what has actually happened during that process is that you have some starting conceptual distance between your disciplines. And, and sometimes that distance is pretty short if, if you're working with, across disciplines that are fairly similar. And sometimes it's pretty large if they're very dissimilar. Um, but as you evolve these mental models, you evolve them towards one another, towards the other discipline. And so you get this decreasing conceptual distance that makes it easier for you to try to find common ground and linkages across disciplines. So that's how we think that these boundary negotiating uh, objects work. And then we have to embed them in that process, which um, I said is so important. So the blue and red things in the middle are, are those mental models and boundary negotiating objects. And here what we've done is we've added some process information. So we still have, if you look to the left of the blue circles, we have this, we know it's important for you to reflect and transform your, your mental models. That has to be part of the process because that's what invokes your cognitive change. And on the right of those, we say co-create boundary negotiating objects that change through time. We know that's gotta be part of the process. And so now we've added some other stuff. So at the top, we have participant one. At the bottom, we have participant two. We recognize that that process, how they engage in that process depends on two factors. And this is taken from work by Misra et al. in 2015. They studied a bunch of teams and a bunch of factors that uh, helped explain how the success of the team worked. And so they separated into two factors, the CSB, which was cognitive skills and behaviors, and VAB was values, attitudes, and beliefs. And so in our process model here, you'll see that on the left, we have something about intrapersonal skills, that's that VAB. And on the right, we have something about interpersonal skills, that's that CSB. And so we know our process has to address both of those things because every participant has different characteristics in each of those areas. And so on the left, at the far left, you see all these arrows engaging with each other. On the left, you see that we know we need to catalyze active listening and reflective practices in order to get that reflection and transformations of your mental models. And on the right, we say we have to navigate and negotiate and expose the differences in, in CSB and VAB so that you can manage those as you're working. Now, it sounds like a lot, but the reality is that we, we put a process together that we facilitate. So you don't have to remember how to do all this. You don't even really have to understand it all, although we like to explain it because we like to believe that uh, once you go through some of our training, you'll be able to take it elsewhere and you'll be able to design your own team interactions uh, with something more uh, knowledgeable, more uh, effective than just ad hoc table discussions or seminars. One thing that we have really found is important to the process is that you give individuals, participants, a chance to work independently on their own at the very beginning, organizing their own thinking and producing some sort of boundary negotiating object about their own perspective that they think they will help them explain it to other people in the group. And so now you just take time to go through each of those individual DNOs and talk about them and ask questions and hopefully come away from that with a better understanding of the other person's discipline and research interests. But what in practice, if you were just gonna say, well, okay, what does that mean? What does that look like? Then every Ember's activity is comprised of five basic steps. We let individuals organize their messy thinking by creating a visual. Then we do turn taking. We go around the table, each individual explains their thinking using a visual. And then the team starts from scratch co-creating a visual. And they work on that for a while. And the team reflects on the process and the outcomes. And then we iterate over that. That, that boundary negotiating object becomes the starting point for another iteration. And then we come at this well, from different perspectives. We have do different kinds of diagrams. We do different activities. We have them think about it from different directions. So every activity is a little bit different, but they're sequenced to try to help you converge over time onto integrated conceptualizations. So we start out you know, very broad, but 
through time, we help participants try to, with different activities, to try to converge closer and closer to something that could actually become a, a shared problem model. This is a new iteration of the system model I've been showing you. It's in review right now, but you can see that in that process box, we have been able to be much more explicit about the, exactly the kinds of activities and the kinds of interactions will enable learning. In the original conceptual model, we just said learning was one of the things we knew that had to happen. But now we know a lot more about how to help people learn in those teams. We ran two 10-day summer workshops. They were quite intensive with a whole bunch of PhD students from around the country. We recruited them from large interdisciplinary water research projects. None of them had ever interacted before. They were from different institutions, different disciplines. We collected and analyzed a wide variety of data. We ran them through all these activities across the 10 days. This was what the summary of the conclusion that we came to was that all participants indicated the experience was transformative, provided knowledge and skills unavailable elsewhere, filled gaps in their graduate education programs, and improved confidence in their capacity for inter- and transdisciplinary research. Pre- and post-workshop surveys confirmed that the framework changed participants' knowledge, behaviors, and competencies for engaging across disciplines. Many students have reported that they have used the framework in a variety of other research and education test settings, indicating they are able to transfer their new competencies to other contexts. We think that's qu quite good outcome. The students, and not just students, we've done this with faculty as well, are really benefiting um, from this training and is making them think about how to do interdisciplinary teamwork in a different way. And so that's really a terrific outcome.